ass all day, son. Hey, Google, how do I deal with a jerk? You know what you gotta do. You gotta show no fear, you gotta speak from your heart, and you gotta let your words fly from way downtown. Okay, okay. Yo, Larry Turd, yo mama's Oh, man. I feel like the way I should start this is just by saying, like, don't try this at home, <laughs> right? Like, <laughs> do you realize that you and I are being played like pawns? Let me explain. I'll break this down for you. Um, video game creators like the video game Fortnite app-based game creators, you know, like Words with Friends, do you know that they hire and they pay these people really well, psychiatrists, psychologists, and neuroscientists, so that when they design the game, they will be designed for the purpose of um, leaning into your addictive tendencies so that they can become the most addictive games possible. Why? Because their entire funding stream is based on how much time you spend on the game, how many people buy it, and how much time they spend on it. And so the mentality, they literally are paying people a lot of money to research you so that they can, they can create a game that is ultra addictive. Do you know that um, the same... So similarly, social media giants, you know, like Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, you know, they do something similar and they have paid people to do the same kind of research so that you'll spend the maximum amount of time on their apps. And so they know that every time you get a notification that says you got a like or a comment or there's, some, there's a new story that you will, it, what it does, and here's what's going on. So just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to jump right in. I'm going to give you the information. Here's what they're researching. What will release chemicals in your brain that triggers the reward system that you don't even know you have? So this is the feeling that when you accomplish something, maybe when you were a kid and you ran across the finish line and you got like this crazy, weird feeling that because you won a race. Well, what's happening is deep in your brain, there is a reward system that releases chemicals that are as powerful as heroin. And it hits your brain system, it gives you this surge, and it feels really good. Well, the same thing happens when you get a like on a post that you put out. And what happens is your body becomes dependent on those chemicals being released, released into your brain. And there are people that are studying what it takes to release those chemicals and how to get your body to release more of them. So whether you know it or not, some of you are chemically addicted to social media, to video games. This is why if you take someone's phone away from them, they will begin to exhibit withdrawal symptoms similar to someone coming off of heroin. Big data companies, companies like, hey, Google, create really complex algorithms so that they know you better than you know yourself. So you get ads that pop up, and you're wondering, wonder why I got that ad. Believe it or not, they are tracking your every move online, wherever your phone goes, everything your phone does, everything you do online, and they're customizing the ads that pop up, the stuff that populates, the stories that populate, because they probably know you and your desires better than you do, meaning they know what you want and like better than you do. And they're feeding you information and sales and commercials that you don't even even realize are appealing to your every desire. CBS charged five point two five and a quarter million dollars per 30 second commercial during the Super Bowl. So you saw commercials like for Pringles and M&Ms. That was the one where the, the mom's driving and she's yelling at the kids in the back. And then she's like, I will eat you alive. And, and she's talking to the M&Ms back there. And uh, M&M commercials, whatever, the, whatever your favorite commercial was, every one of those companies paid five and a quarter million dollars per 30 second spot. You, you think that a company is going to pay that much money? 
and not get a return on their investment, though they know that they're going to trigger something in your brain that's going to tell you you can't live without Pringles. You can't survive for another minute without going and getting some M&Ms or buying that car or drinking that beer. That something in you says, I have to have it. <laughs> The gaming and the gambling industry spend lots of money doing this. They, they're the experts at neuroscience, meaning they know what it takes to trigger those reward systems in your brain and how to keep you from disengaging. You don't know this if you've ever gotten maybe trapped into gambling. Maybe you've seen some, one of those apps come up on your phone, like a commercial to play one of these gambling games on your phone. Here's what's going on. They have studied people and they know what it takes to get you to keep gambling longer and spend the maximum amount of money even to put yourself into extreme debt. They create environments and games and imagery so that you get more and more excited even when you're losing money. And here you thought that you had it figured out. Here, here's the line. If you want to know a kind of a principal statement regarding video games and gaming and porn and online searches and social media, commercials that you watch and gambling, given enough time, the house always wins. Let me just repeat that in case you think that you're going to beat the house. Given enough time, the house always wins. They know you better than you know yourself. And so maybe you have a moment where you, you feel like you've lost control. The truth is, they know something about us, that we are pawns to our passions, and they're playing to our passions. And so maybe you've had a moment where you feel like you lost control. By definition, if you've lost control, then something else is in control of you. And some of us have yielded control of our decisions to big data and social media giants and gaming in, in the gaming industry. And so basically, we've handed over to them the keys to the car of our life, the keys to our brain, to our desires, to our addictions. And the same works within relationships. Very few of us are in control of our reactions, our words, the way we interact and treat people. Most of us are just pawns to our passions. And the thing about, just like I talked about gaming and online searches and what you're buying, it feels good for a moment. Like when you react the wrong way, it's also triggering something chemically inside of you that feels good. It feels good to yell. It feels good to call a name. It feels good to insult for a moment because it releases something chemically inside of you. So <laughs> how do we get it right? I mean, what do we do about this problem that we are all pawns to our passions, especially when it comes to the way we interact with each other, especially when it comes to conflict, like when we get angry, when we react the wrong way, when we, when we get into a skirmish or a fight, how do we get this right? And so I want to jump into the book of Proverbs. It's in the Bible. So this is different than just some, you know, any fortune cookie that you open or any other Proverbs that you hear, because the book of Proverbs written by King Solomon is written from the perspective of an author who's saying not just what's a good idea, but what are God ideas, not just suggestions for how to live well, but God's guidance for how to live skillfully, how to live right. And so I want to jump in. The first thing I want to do is take apart the way we get it wrong. So the author of Proverbs, he's going, here's a lot of wrong ways to handle other people, especially when it comes to conflict. So let's just jump right in. Proverbs chapter 9, verse 8, he says, Do not rebuke mockers, or they will hate you. Um, <laughs> okay, so what he's saying here is similar to a little a phrase, uh, a quote maybe you've heard. Uh, Don't wrestle with a pig. You'll both get dirty, but only, only the pig will like it. That's basically what he's saying here. He goes, you get, in a, you get in an argument with people who want to argue, you're going to lose every time because they're actually having a good time with it. Let, let's read through a couple more Proverbs on just kind of things not to do. And then I'm going to take all these, put them together, and give you like, here's 10 things that are the wrong way to handle a conflict. So let's just jump in. Proverbs chapter 12, verse 16. We're just going to run through a couple quickly. Fools show their annoyance at once. They're pawns to their annoyance. Every fool is quick to quarrel. They give in to their anger and their urges. Proverbs chapter 15. A harsh word 
stirs up anger. I mean, when you react the wrong way, it's kind of like, you know, uh, somebody brings a, a knife to the fight, you pull out the gun, they pull out the machine gun, you have to get a tank, they get a fighter jet, this thing just escalates out of control. The mouth of the fool gushes folly. Let's keep going here, a couple more. To answer before listening, that is folly and shame. It's, in, it's an embarrassment to you. And then let me just kind of read through this whole passage. Like one who grabs a stray dog by the ears is someone who rushes into a quarrel, not their own. Some of you, you, you have been running around grabbing dogs by the ears and not realizing it. I'll just tell you a quick story. My, um, I have a scar on my hand because my older brothers thought it'd be really funny to see what would happen if our cat... <laughs> Now you're, you're going to discover why I feel how I feel about cats. So I was like five years old. And my older brother said, hey, Patrick, I wonder if this cat can swim. Here, throw it in the stream. Five years old. This is, now you're going to hear all the trauma. So I took Lily over to the stream and tried to throw her in to the stream. I didn't know any better. Well, Lily didn't like the idea of getting thrown in the stream, and so Lily held on for dear life on my hand, and I have scars to prove it. She never ended up in the stream. My brothers thought it was somewhat comical. <laughs> Some of you, you're trying to throw cats in the streams. You're picking fights that are never going to work out well. Like one who grabs a trade dog by the ears is someone who constantly is rushing in to fights and arguments that are not even yours. Like a maniac, uh, I like this, just, I like the wording of it. Like a maniac shooting flaming arrows, ah, just launching craziness. Arrows of death is someone who deceives their neighbor and says, oh, I was only joking. He's saying, that this, is, this is insanity. You don't get to go around going, oh, I was just kidding, while you're mocking them and hurting them and tearing people down. Let me keep going here with this passage. Without wood, a fire goes out. You see the wisdom in that? So you, you just can't help but keep throwing wood on the fire. Without a gossip, a quarrel dies down. As charcoal to embers and as wood to a fire is a quarrelsome person for kindling strife. Okay, so I'm going to give you the quick version, all right? Let's just take all of that, put it in a couple. Ten w wrong ways to react in a conflict. All right, this is, these are the 10 ways that you are a pawn to your passions. Do this, and you're basically being played. You're being used. You're being taken advantage of. Something beyond you is in control of you. Here they are. Let's just jump right in. So, 10 wrong ways. Be condescending. That'll work out well, meaning act better than others. Number two, deflect and distract. Always get off topic. You know, go in other directions. Don't stay focused on the actual problem. Number three, be rude. Call people names and insult them. Some of you are starting to go, ooh, ouch. Number four, argue with people who like to argue. That's the whole, you know, wrestle with the pig thing. Number five, be quick-tempered. Let your anger control you rather than controlling your anger. Number six, pick sides in other people's arguments. Number seven, hold grudges. What I should have said here is hold a grudge and drudge up the past. Grudge and drudge. Hold a grudge, drudge up the past. Meaning, you know, don't overlook an offense. Don't forgive people. Just keep the issue going. Number eight, react before finding out what's really going on. You know, some of us parents, we need to pay attention to that one, right? Like, we tend to jump in and react before we really find out what's going on. Number nine, overreact. You know, this is the whole pull out the knife, they pull out a gun, and we escalate the situation. And then number 10, avoid conflict. Just avoid it altogether. Or avoid dealing with tension at all. Okay, so here's the thing. The book of Proverbs, he's trying to guide us in a God way to deal with issues. So what's the God way to deal with conflict so that our conflict can be life-giving? So we're skillful in the way we interact with people to avoid being pawns to our passions. So I'm gonna give you a principle. Here's the principle, and this, you can apply this principle to every one of those categories I already talked about. So I was talking about video games. 
gaming apps, gambling, commercials, your desires that stir up in you. This principle works across the board, but it really applies when it comes to conflict. Here it is. Discover the power of a right first response. What I'm trying to say here is this. If you can get your first response correct, the rest will take care of themselves. It is the first response that usually sets the course of the next several moments. Someone mistreats you. What you do first will create the path that you're on. You, you, you're tempted by something. The, your first moment is going to determine the outcome. And so what I'm trying to train you is, this, this is true in neuroscience. This is true when there's psychiatrists and psychologists are studying us. This is also true in relationships. Your first response will determine the outcome. And so discover the power of the first response. So let's, let's talk about this. Why is it that what should be said is conflict is inevitable. Combat is optional. You like that? But that's not how we live. No, no, no. The way you and I live is conflict is inevitable. Combat is inevitable. It seems like the moment the spark ignites, there's a forest fire. And you and I seem to have an inability to get off the train once that thing starts rolling. We just, we just keep fueling the fire. We just keep going with it, and it gets escalated, and it gets out of control. We give in to urges, and they destroy us. But here's what I want you to know. The problem is not that there's these outside forces playing us. We are not just being manipulated by outside industries, businesses that are trying to profit off of us. What we fail to realize is that there is an inside force that's playing us. You and I are being played by the power that is alive inside of us, and it's called sin. It's a spiritual force that you and I were born with that stirs urges, desires, that drive decisions that create destructive behavior. This sin thing, this spiritual force, is what drives us away from God toward believing that just because it feels good, it must be good. Because it creates a reward fulfillment in our brain that tells us this feels good, therefore it must be good. Sin, the mission, the spiritual sin is out to destroy us. Not just separate us from relationship with God and wreck relationships and hurt us, but leave us on a life course toward eternal judgment. But God was unwilling to leave us on that life course and so he intervened, not just by giving us a book of Proverbs, God, God ideas, but to actually give us the power to live out that wisdom. What I mean is he didn't just give us a book of wisdom. He gave us the spirit of wisdom to actually do what we read. How? Here's what Jesus did. 950 years after this book was compiled and written, Jesus showed up. God became a human in order to rescue us. He stepped in between us and the, and the sin impulses that drove us, this sin that creates eternal ruin, and he rescued us. How? He took on our sin shame. Our sin judgment, the eternal death sentence that we placed, he gathered up and he put on himself. So when Jesus died, he died once for all. So that anyone who believes in Jesus by faith is forgiven of their sin. Shame, guilt removed. And in place of that, God gives us his spirit because Jesus not only died, he rose again from the dead and in his resurrection, he defeated this power of sin. He freed us from the fear of death and eternal judgment. So when you believe in Jesus, here's actually what's going on. When you believe in Jesus, sin is defeated in your life. The impulses of sin are unplugged and God's spirit enters into our spirit. So now we are given the power and the responsibility of a new first response where previously we just gave into reactions that lead to death. Now we're given the power to choose a better first response that produces life. So let's jump in. I want to give you a, a little passage of scripture that's going to give us some insight into how to actually make this practical. Galatians chapter 5. This is the Apostle Paul writing to the church in the area of Galatia. And in there, he's talking about this very idea. And he says this, but the fruit of the Spirit, meaning what comes out of the Spirit of God living in you, is love, joy, peace, 
forbearance, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I mean, when you have God's spirit in you, he empowers you to be self-controlled. So I want you to think differently about this. Some of you, you've been trying really hard to break an addiction. And you don't even realize that there are people that are studying you who know you better than you know yourself. They know what triggers those chemicals in your brain. And you and I are fighting a losing battle. So we've got to do is yield to God. So the principle I want you to write down and make note of is this. Become spirit-controlled, not just self-controlled. When Paul is writing to the church in Galatia, what he's saying is when God's spirit is in you, then you have the power to love, to have joy, to have peace, patience, kindness, gentleness, and self-control, which means the source of my self-control is not my moral determination. It's not my self-will. Some of you are really strong-willed. Some of you have a a really, I mean, you determine to do something, you're going to do it. And yet, even you haven't been able to beat some of the addictions that drive you. Some of the reactions that come out of you, you say the wrong thing, you react the wrong way. Why? Because we still have sin that drives us. And so, we have to become spirit-controlled rather than just self Controlled. What I specifically mean is you and I need to yield to God's spirit so he is taking over our lives and he is guiding our reactions. In essence, where previously I really didn't have responsibility because I wasn't in control. Now, you're not off the hook, all right? But if you don't believe in Jesus, how are you going to defeat being played like a pawn. Well, when you believe in Jesus by faith and his spirit takes control, now you are responsible and you are empowered to have self-control because it's God's spirit in you leading you. So how do we do this? So I want to jump in. I want to give you another passage. Uh, Okay, so now that you have God's spirit controlling you, leading you, guiding how you you speak, the decisions you make, you're, you're yielding to God's spirit. Let's jump in. Jesus is saying this about dealing with people. When you're in an argument, when you're facing a conflict, he says this, if you're offering your gift at the altar and there you remember, meaning if you come to church and you're, offering, you're in worship, this is your gift. Or you're, or you're writing a check or you go onto our app and you're gonna give a gift to the church because you wanna give it as a gift of worship to God. He says, in that moment, you remember that your brother or sister has something against you. While you're worshiping or while you're praying or while you're giving, you remember, oh my goodness, I, I said the wrong thing to that person and they're hurt by me. He goes, in that moment, here's what I want you to do. Stop what you're doing. Put your hands down. Stop giving. Now, have you ever heard of a pastor in a church say, stop giving to the church and, and do what Jesus said? He said, leave your gift there in front of the altar. Don't even finish giving it. Just run, okay? First go and be reconciled to them. Get it right in relationship. Then come back and offer your gift. Settle matters quickly with your adversary who is taking you to court. Check this out. Can you imagine that? God is saying, before you come to worship me, stop what you're doing and go make it right with others. Deal with problems. So what's the point? First response, meaning getting your first response right, is proactive, not reactive. Proactive, not reactive. Here's the challenge. Most of us are being controlled by something else. We're out of control. Our anger is in control. Our attitude is in control. Our hurts, our past, our pain is in control of us. We're being played like pawns. But God doesn't play you. You are not being played by God. You are, a not, you are not a pawn of God. You are a child of God. And he is giving you the power to choose a better first response. And so you have a responsibility to be proactive, not reactive. So how do you be proactive? Well, I'm going to give you a couple steps to be proactive. Well, what that means is you deal with tension quickly. That's what Jesus was saying, right? You're, you're in worship. You're ready to give. And suddenly you realize, oh my goodness, I walked out the door and I said something rude to my spouse. Maybe I should step out of the service, call them and say, I'm sorry. That was wrong. That hit close enough to home? Some of you, you have your, you're holding the hand of the person that you say you love and you weren't very loving on the way here. You need to stop. 
and make it right. Deal with things quickly. The moment you sniff tension, deal with it. Get it right. Even if you just believe someone else was hurt by you, go to them and make it right. Jesus didn't say, if you have a problem with someone, go and make it right. He goes, if you remember that someone was offended by you, you go and make it right. Deal with tension quickly. Be proactive when it comes to conflict resolution. So let me give you a couple of thoughts on how to do that. Right there. Think first. How do you think first? Simply pause. A, a rule in order to be proactive is to think first by pausing. Pause. Take a breath. Why? Here's, here's what you're going to do when you pause. Let's say the passions are rising up and you're ready, to, you're ready to lash out in anger. If you pause, here's what you're going to do. Pray. How would God want me to respond? What does God's word say? L let me give you a couple other challenges. Say no. Put it down. Sit down. Another challenge I want to give you. So here, here, here's the uh, wisdom of Proverbs. He goes like this. Better a patient person than a warrior. One with self-control than one who takes a city. You know what he's saying? He goes, the power of patience, the power of a pause is more powerful than an army that can conquer a city. Why? Because self-control requires more strength than the weapons to conquer a city. You are a more powerful warrior if you can bite your tongue than if you know if you're a you know, multi-degree black belt. That takes less training and less self-control than to bite your tongue and pause and pray and think first. Now, another thing I want to make sure you get, think first. So I said, think first, pause. Another thing I want you to do, think first by asking, what will happen if? This is one of the most powerful questions you can ever ask. In the moment where you're ready to choose a reaction versus a first response, if you ask yourself, just pause and you say, what will happen if? What will happen if I cheat on my wife? What will happen if I look at the porn? What will happen if I eat that? What will happen if I say that? What will happen if I react the way I want to react? What will happen if I take this drug? That one question will cause you to think through the consequences. I have almost never seen someone make a bad decision when they said, what will happen if? Because the moment you start to think through the outcome, the moment you start to think through consequences, your, your executive th thinking, your frontal cortex kicks in. And you begin to process the implications of your decision and you just make better decisions. You're yielding to God because you're asking what will happen if. So let me give you another principle here. We're going to jump into a list of problems. I'm going to run through this quick and I'm going to give you a final insight into how to do this right. Here's, here's just a compilation of some proverbs. The prudent overlook an insult. A gentle answer turns away wrath. Starting a quarrel is like breaching a dam, meaning you're breaking open a dam and you don't know what you're letting loose. So drop the matter before a dispute breaks out. It is to one's glory to overlook an offense. The principle I want to give you is this. This is the, I'm going to unpack this in just a moment, but the, the idea here is simply fight fair. Now, that, that sounds a little strange, but I'm going to have you all say, all of our campuses, you're, you're joining me. I always want you to say this, fight. fight. All right, maybe those of you in Chambersburg, you're going to do this with me. You're at cinemas. Help me out here, right? Fight. Fight. Fair. Fair. Fight. Fair. Fight. Okay, so what are the rules to fighting fair? in conflict, in relationships. So I'm going to break this down really quickly. I'm going to put it up on the screen. Hopefully you can write this down. And hey, we'll post it on social media and you will get a lot of likes and comments. It'll make us all feel good. But here's the deal, right? Rules to fighting fair. Don't overreact. If your response is bigger than the issue, you're overreacting. Now, I'm going to give you a little insight. If someone else if their response is bigger than the matter in front of you, there's something else going on. Look, if, if, if you, you know, maybe you, I don't know, you said something to your spouse, and, you know, you were a little bit, maybe you didn't think, and they just lose it. 
and they get in their car and they drive off. You're like, There's, you probably forgot your anniversary. It wasn't that moment. Something else is going on, all right? So this is important. If you realize whatever response you're getting, if it is disproportionate to the issue at hand, there is something else going on and you need to deal with it. So if your response is bigger than the issue at hand, you've got something else going on inside of you and that needs to get dealt with. Because otherwise, you're going to spend your life overreacting, and it's unhealthy. Some of you just need to, you need to spend more time with God in prayer. Some of you need to get into counseling and therapy to work through some of those issues because you're carrying all this baggage, and it just gets dumped on everybody. So get healthy emotionally. All right, another one. Don't be cruel. Be careful. What I mean here is, man, don't, don't be brutal with people. Don't be mean to people. Don't be unkind. Be careful the way you speak and react. All right, this is going to give way to the next point. Uh, avoid low blows and avoid insulting people. Avoid name calling. Avoid, and I'm going to get to another point about judging up the past, but that's a low blow. Man, avoid low blows, right? That's the, that's the punch that hurts. All right, we'll keep going here. Keep matters private. Some of you, you can't, Look, can I just tell you, if it's a conflict issue, it doesn't belong on social media. Husbands, wives, girlfriends, boyfriends, don't put it on social media. The thing is, number one, nobody else cares. And we're, if, if we care, it's because we're like, what, what's wrong with them? Stop it. Man, you could, save, you could save your marriage. You could save a relationship by just keeping it private. Don't go talking with everybody else before you talk with them. Keep it private. You, you can bring healing to your relationships by keeping a matter private so you can actually work through it with them. Don't drudge up the past. Forgive quickly. Some of you, man, you got such a great memory. You're like an elephant. You can remember everything anywhere. You can quote it. You remember chapter and verse, what they said and when they said it, and you pull it out like an arrow and you just shoot it right into people's hearts and it's destructive. Just stop it. That's not fighting fair. All right, stay focused. Meaning, keep your focus on whatever caused the issue, deal with that issue, and then move on. If you're finding that you can't stay focused in a conflict, it might be because there's other issues going on, get that one right. Then, at another point, come back to the other issues that you need to deal with and say, hey, sweetheart, can we talk that through? Or talk with a friend and say, hey, I got, this has been bothering me. I'm sorry I didn't deal with it sooner, but can we talk about that, right? So stay focused on the issue. Here's my challenge to you. Conflict is inevitable, but combat should be optional. Can you imagine if all of us were freed from being played like pawns? Imagine big data couldn't manipulate you and all these social media giants couldn't abuse you and take advantage of you. Imagine the gaming industry had no hold on you because you simply unplugged. Imagine no matter what they tried to play on you, it wouldn't work because you were spirit-controlled rather than trying to be self-controlled because you were freed from the grip of sin and God's spirit was leading your first response. So here's what I want to do. I want to take a moment. I want to pray over you. Some of you, this is a moment where you, you, you need to yield to God. God, I've been, I've been played all of my life, and I need to put my faith in Jesus Christ. If that's a decision you're making, now is a great moment to make that decision. For others of you, you, you believe in Jesus, but you've been manipulated all of your life, and it's time to say, God, I need your spirit to take control rather than me trying really hard to be self-controlled. Would you take a moment? Let me pray over you. Jesus, thank you that you loved us so much that you didn't come to play us. You came to call us children of God. You came to rescue us from the grip of sin in our lives. And so thank you for loving us so much that you gave us new life. We receive that by faith. We believe in Jesus Christ. We receive the freedom that comes from believing in him because you, you forgive us and you free us and you give us your spirit so that we have the power to choose a better first response. Now, God, our commitment is this. Help us in every temptation, in moments of conflict, when we're, when we're feeling a desire or an urge that isn't right that comes up, would you empower us with the right first response? Would you bring healing to broken relationships? Would you heal marriages? Would you release us from the power of addictions that have been controlling us, the power of life habits that have just gripped us? God, we're asking for freedom now by your spirit. 
In Jesus' name, amen. We hope that you have enjoyed today's experience. We also hope that this message has challenged you and will encourage you in the upcoming week. And if you made a decision to follow Jesus Christ today, congratulations, welcome to the family, and welcome home. One of the most important first steps that you can take is by letting us know. You can click the prayer tab or you can visit us at lifehousechurch.org. And if this message or ministry has blessed you in any way, feel free to partner with us financially. You can click on the Give tab or you can visit our website and click Give. We are so thankful that you joined us and we are thankful that you are part of our extended family. We can't wait to see you back here next week.